We start part three with a painting that is probably most associated with Sargent, and honestly the one that probably causes him the most problems in his life, uh, the portrait of Madame X, also known as uh, Madame Gautreau. Uh, and this is an interesting portrait because he wasn't commissioned to do this, he actually just did this as more of a showcase piece, uh, kind of showing off his talent. Uh, from my understanding, he wanted to kind of have this be like the calling card piece of his career uh, as a portrait artist, and uh, it just turned out really badly for him. Uh, uh, the critics really slammed the painting uh, for many different reasons, but it, it was just way too seductive. Uh, if you look at the straps on, on the painting, uh, those were actually much lower, and he actually painted them up. Uh, her skin is very, very white. It's this kind of porcelain uh, tone that was this mixture of purple, and, and uh, I believe uh, she actually wore some kind of like lavender powder as well. We see a lot of work uh, going into this one painting, and we have uh, several other images of Madame Gautreau as well. Uh, again, she's a socialite uh, of the time, a very popular woman in the social circles uh, that, that Sargent would have been uh, privy to, these kind of upper class, more uh, uh, e exaggerated lifestyles, if you will, uh, of the rich and famous of the time period kind of thing. Uh, but again, uh, when, when we look at this painting in, in the proximity of, of what it does to his career, uh, as I mentioned, it, it isn't well received. And even though we, we kind of look at it now as this masterpiece, uh, at the time it was very shocking for the people, uh, and it kind of derailed his career a little bit. I have a few more images in here uh, that, that uh, Sergeant did of Gautreau, Madame Gautreau. Well, we're kind of discussing the whole thing. So it caused him a controversy, and even after he renames it uh, to Madame X, it still puts a major dap in, uh, on his career as a portrait painter. And, and this, in combination with a, a few other factors, really does kind of lead him uh, to seek other grounds. And as I mentioned in, in one of the other lectures, we know that uh, he's already showing at the Royal Academy in England, uh, and again, this with, with several other factors in his life really leads him forward uh, to move to England eventually uh, and to kind of continue his work there. Again, uh, it was a significant scandal in the social circles of the time, and uh, when we think about the fact here's just a couple more wonderful images. Here's a wonderful drawing uh, in a watercolor and the full range of media. He must have been very much en enchanted with uh, Madame Gautreau, as I, as I hear many people were actually enchanted with Madame Gautreau uh, at the time, and this is probably why it caused uh, so much of a problem. It's not that, uh, if you look at her biography, from my understanding, it's not that he's not painting anything uh, that isn't really true in, in the guise of the portrait, uh, but again, it, it, it was just kind of too much. Uh, and and it, it's really interesting because he, he really thought of it as his masterpiece at first, and, and uh, it was one of these things where I don't think he could even really understand at first why uh, it caused so much of a controversy. But again, uh, the combination of all of the factors of that painting uh, leads him to move to England in 1886. Now, uh, he has some associates. He knows Henry James, the, the author uh, in England. And, and again, as I mentioned, he had already uh, kind of established himself in, in, as a portrait artist somewhat in England uh, through the Royal Academy and so, through some of his earlier paintings. So moving to England was really uh, an effort as much as anything else to kind of just bring his art career back around, if you will, uh, in, in order to establish himself in a different location uh, and to continue doing what he wanted to do, which was these portrait paintings, uh, which would fund his more extravagant lifestyle. We also have the portrait of Dr. Posey at home in his uh, very, very red bathrobe here. This is such a carnal painting. It's, it's uh, interesting. Uh, and it's also there in this time that he visits Claude Monet. And again, when we think about uh, Claude Monet and, and we think about Monet's work uh, and the other Impressionist, again, this is 1885, so uh, this is this is pretty far down the road. Uh, I mentioned this before. He's, he's close friends with uh, some of the Impressionists, even though his style 
in terms of his portrait painting is is kind of removed from that uh, and to me when we look at his watercolors and a lot of his more personal work uh, there is kind of this influence of uh, the impressionistic style we, we do see this kind of flair of the brushstroke and, and, and this type of thing but uh, again when we look at the biography of Sargent uh, this is this has got to be kind of a period of uh, indecision and searching as much as anything else uh, again we have this kind of a notion of him having this wonderful career in Paris and it seems everything is fine and then uh, the the everything just kind of gets pulled out right underneath him and uh, in addition to moving to England we do see kind of this little bit of a search uh, in terms of of what he's looking to do I mean again uh, uh, this must have been kind of a reset moment in his life and as we see him uh, traveling to Giverny to, to visit Monet uh, in that very impressionistic painting I, I imagine uh, uh, for a while, he was, uh, again, putting into consideration what it is that uh, it, it means to be an artist and what he wants to do. Uh, again, he's interesting because he really is a thinks of art as, as a career in, in many senses, and, and uh, I wonder if, if within him he has this dialogue uh, about what... Um, what he wants to really become at the end of the day. Uh, but we do see him returning uh, to portraiture work when he goes to England. We have uh, Sally Fels Fairchild here again, uh, kind of this in and out of, of focus type of aspect of uh, uh, portraiture, but again, we have this wonderful look on her face. Uh, we have this wonderful use of both these pink and this wonderful splotched blue background where uh, we can register this as a wall or, or any number of things. But again, uh, when he moves to England in, in, a, in a short due of time, uh, he does return to doing portrait work and, and again, uh, just kind of starts his business in a different location. But uh, as we kind of continue and look at his work, uh, his reputation does precede him, uh, and we, we do get these kind of more interesting uh, images as well as, as what we think of as the normal portrait paintings. Uh, again, this is another one of these wonderful watercolors uh, where, where I imagine he's off on some jaunt with uh, some of his close friends, and, and this is really just him uh, relaxing and, and making art. Uh, for himself and for his own enjoyment. Um, again, he doesn't really pursue any type of financial gain by way of his watercolors, and in many ways, uh, that's what makes them so enjoyable, is when we look at them, uh, they're free of, of that type of mental competition that uh, he ensues within himself with the other works, where it, it is uh, this perfection that he's seeking with this. Uh, they are a lot more playful, both in the posturing uh, and also in his handling of the material. Uh, Carnation Lily Lily Rose, uh, shown at the Royal Academy as it says, purchased by the Tate. Uh, again, this is really his quintessential effort to get into the English genre, if you will. We have uh, these two two girls, and again, this influence of Japanese culture uh, can be seen through most of the art of the time. Uh, Sargent is, is absolutely no exception to the rule. Here we have these wonderfully lit uh, Japanese lanterns. This is actually one of my favorite Sargent paintings uh, because of, of uh, again, this this idea that we're kind of a, a, a silent observer for the scene, but the flowers seem to overtake everything uh, with the height of these these little girls, and uh, it, it, it's, it really just becomes a decorative element uh, within the work itself. In 1887 through 1888, we actually see Sargent returning uh, to America, returning. Actually, I don't. I don't believe he had actually been here before. Even though, again, he claims an American uh, citizenship by the way of his parents. But what we see him doing, uh, both in New York and Boston, is is very much kind of the same thing we saw in Paris and also in England. Him. Uh, uh, associating himself with the wealthier members uh, and getting these wonderful portraits done. And, and again, when we look at the uh, amazing number of portraits that he did of American artists, or excuse me, Americans uh, during this time period, he was only in America for a very short time, uh, but he creates an entire range of work uh, all centered around these artists. And of particular note is how we actually look at 
uh, how these women are portrayed, and, and I think that this is a wonderful comparison of uh, uh, his range when we look at these two women uh, in a very starkly different feeling that we get from them. A lot of it is almost characterized by the background color, uh, where we have a, a portrait of Mrs. Adrian Isselin, uh, this very, very gray stone nature where you can see she's a stern woman. Uh, well, Mrs. George Gribble, uh, there on the right, she seems more like a socialite who is uh, very enjoyably having fun with her life. Uh, but again, the likeness is something that we cannot kind of uh, sidestep. When we look at uh, Sargent's work, he is a master of his craft and just in terms of, of creating a likeness of an individual. Uh, one of my favorite paintings from his this period is, is Alice Vanderbilt Shepherd, uh, again, a, a younger person. And when we look at uh, uh, his work, he has this amazing capacity of, of capturing uh, this inner essence of youth within these people. Again, uh, we see this stern or this this uh, strength within this young girl, but at the same time, she still has the whimsical nature, uh, uh, this faraway looking and, and, and careless or carefreeness rather uh, that one would associate with youth. Uh, again, a wonderful series of, of portrait paintings that he did uh, during his brief stay in America. And again, he does return to America later on in his life. Uh, and, and a lot of the work we see there is very interesting because he explores a lot of the country. Uh, but again, you can see kind of an evolution occurring uh, within his work. And when we look at Morning Walk from 1888, a beautiful painting, uh, not only in, in, in terms of the figure itself and, and how he's created uh, this central central figure uh, with this delicacy, almost as if she's a flower growing uh, up out of uh, uh, the, the, the greenage around her, reflecting on this beautiful pond. Uh, it's as if he might have been looking at a Monet painting uh, in the background when when he was actually painting this. But uh, again, the complexity of his work uh, can really not be understated, uh, again, between uh, what he's able to do with the background to the portrait of the individual.